Well, I can attest that what Randall is saying is working because even though he's not my broker, he has been helping me greatly with, um, with a number of my properties. And uh, it's extremely helpful. Uh, you type in that, that great description and people just can't wait to come and see your properties. He just does a great job. And uh, I, I just want to thank you enough. It's really, it, it's really helpful. Greatly helpful. You know, even though you've been in the business forever and ever and ever, when you have somebody kind of just go over it and gloss it over, it, it makes a big difference. So we're here tonight to talk about when I first meet with an investor, the, the things that I want them to know is I want to give them a comparative market analysis and have them understand what the value of a property is when they get it all fixed up. I want them to be able to learn how to evaluate repairs, and I want to try to make their, their remodeling decisions as easy as possible, because I deal with people who are just getting into to investing. Once you've been investing for a while, you don't need a realtor. You can do all this you know, very much yourself. But when you're first getting in there, you need, you need to know some things. So we're going to be pretty basic here. And then, of course, then you're going to have Matt uh, come up, and he's going to talk to you about some advanced ways to evaluate properties. But to, to begin with, we're going to talk about a comparative market analysis. And why do we need a comparative market analysis? Any of you who have had a comparative market analysis from a real estate agent, why, why is that important? What is that going to help you with? Competition. Purchase. Yeah. Comparables. So why do you need comparables? To know where to sell it. Okay, so you know what it's going to sell for, right? So your comparative market analysis is going to give you your after repair value. And you want your after repair value so that you can figure out what you're going to offer for the property. When you make your money? When you buy the, when you buy the property. Okay, so you've got to buy low enough so that you can cover all of the things that are going to happen. You don't want to be the investor who bought this property and ran out of money and then has to sell his, all of his appliances. You don't want to be that person. So, you know, we're not going to go into exactly how you come up with this because we've been through this time and time and time again. Just know that the after repair value, from the after repair value, if you're going to resell, you're going to take off your closing costs, you're going to take off your repairs, you're going to make sure that you take off your profit, you're going to take off all of those things that are listed up there that we've talked about many, many times. And then you're going to get to your offer price if you're reselling. That's not why we're here tonight is to talk about that. That's just so that you understand what we're talking about. Next, from Matt, um, from Matt Atkinson's presentation, those of you who are going to uh, buy rentals. Now, first of all, if you're buying a rental, you know that the comparables are not as important as your cash flow. So if you're going to buy it with your own cash, what you really want to do is you want to look at cash flow, how much are you going to get from it per month, and, and figure out all your costs and go from there. But uh, Matt has come up with some really uh, great things in his last seminar, and here is where you use your after repair value. If you're going to go ahead and, and buy your rental with hard money, you need to know that you need to refinance at 25% of the after repair value. So if you're going to do that, then you need to start doing some subtracting. He did this in his seminar. He did this very, very well. You've got it listed up there. So you need to take your, um, your offer price and your closing costs, and, which includes your hard money. That needs to be taken off of 25% of the after repair value. I think it's pretty simple there. That's why we're talking about after repair value. We're not here to, to discuss how they get to that. That's what Matt covered. But we're, that's why the after repair value is important. Any questions about those things? OK, so reading an, uh, a comparative market analysis. Comparative market analysis, again, is something that will be given to you by a realtor. Um, they don't have to be your realtor. They can be, a, but they do need to be a realtor that works with investors. 
They need to understand that it needs to be a very conservative uh, comparative market analysis and they need to have worked with investors before. So just these are some of the things that we're going to look at on the next slide, just so that you might know. We're going to look at the status, active or sold. We're going to look at the sales price and the sale date for um, cumulative days on market. We're going to look at the bedrooms and the bathrooms. We're going to look at square footage, your build. We're going to then um, go to um, concessions. Those are built in. <laughs> It's so nice with the new MLS. I used to always write in those concessions and I was always doing that figure eight excess and now yeah, I don't have to worry about it because it's already figured in. And then we come to the after repair value. So this is what I want you to take a look at so that you can see what you're doing. Okay, so up here is where the status is. This column right here is the property that you're looking at. This is a comparative market analysis. This is the one sheet. This is the uh, property that you're looking at. This happens to be a property right now that's on the MLS. Um, as of Saturday, you could buy this one. Um, so you can see that these are solds. So these are three comparables that were in the area. And uh, I'm going to use these comparables to come up with a after repair value for this one. So if you look over here, then this is the list price here. This is the sold price here. This is the days on market. When you get the comparative market analysis sent to you on your email, you will be able to see each of the comparisons. You can look and see if it was a short sale or if it was a bank owned or, or whatever. If it's a, a short sale, it may have some more days on market. Um, you know, you just, I, I wouldn't worry about that if it's a short sale. Um, so that one is a short sale, so don't worry necessarily about the days on market. Then you want to take a look, and, and it's kind of important right now that um, about the uh, dates of the uh, the dates that they were sold. Is Vicky here? See here. There she is. I did one for Vicky today. It was very difficult for me because uh, there weren't a lot of comparables right in that area where she she has got this home she wants to, to buy. I could go out a little ways and I could go back further and I could see that there was a great uh, decrease in price in that, in that small area from March to right now. So it was a real difficult to come up with a value there. The closer we were getting to the freeway, the, the, um, the, the less it was going down in price. So sometimes it's a little difficult. You need to make sure that, that um, you're using comparables that are not too, not too far away. Because what are prices doing right now still? They're still going down. Correcting. <laughs> yes, they are correcting. But, uh, it works out really well. Business is great. So don't let anybody tell you business isn't great. It's good thing. Okay, um, bedrooms, bathrooms, square feet. Now, when you get down into this area, this is where the comparison takes place. The MLS in their wisdom has decided that a bedroom is worth about $1,000. They're just doing this for comparison. They could put in lots of other uh, amounts and, and it would probably be out about the same. But they decided that a bedroom is worth about $1,000. They decided the bathroom is worth about $5,000. Um, they decided that a garage is worth about $5,000 per, per car. So when you then look at this, this particular comparable only has three bedrooms. So to this sales price, we need to add some money for a bedroom to make this property just like this property. You need to understand that concept. If you understand that concept, you, you've got the comparative market analysis down. Um, so there's nothing added to this one because it has four bedrooms. This one has three bedrooms, so they've added $1,000 to this price. You just follow that on down through. You'll see here, this one doesn't have, a, this, this one um, didn't put in a, a percentage of, of a basement because there was none. It was not a finished basement. This is not a finished basement. This is a 65% finished basement. So in that case, we needed to subtract some money from this to make it just like this. 
You understand those, those concepts very easily. Now you go ahead, and this is added up. You have three comparables. You add them together, divide by three. That's your average. That's your after repair value. Do you have any questions about reading that comparison? Do you have any uh, reluctance to use short sales in the comps? I do use short sales in my comps. And I use short sales because they are your competition. And you're going to need, if, if, when you get your, your home all fixed up, if your short sales are your competition, whether they're fixed up or not. Dusty, when I prepare these for investors, I do, sometimes I prepare four or five just so that I can see the different numbers. So I'll do one that's specifically using short sell. And I agree with you, short sales are your competition, but at the same time, you have buyers who don't have the ability or don't want to look at short sales anymore. And so it's, it gives you a little head above the rest because your property can sell quicker. It can sell as quickly as a bank home, but usually it's not as distressed. And the other point I wanted to make, and I've had investors learn this the hard way, and that is that a garage isn't always only worth $5,000. Sometimes the fact that it doesn't have a garage or does have a garage can affect its marketability. Oh, I totally Especially agree. in areas with a lot of homes on the market. Totally agree. And that's something that you will always know. I, I think it turns uh, a lot of people have made their uh, garage into a fourth bedroom. I think in Kearns right now that they really, people are really looking for that garage. And so I think if it doesn't have a garage, you probably need to look at it into a garage. Right now, for some reason, and, and I think that this changes as the market goes on, but for right now, that fourth bedroom is as important as the garage. So, yeah, all of those things are, are very important to look at. Okay, you will get this with your comparative market analysis so that you can see where they are in uh, relation to your uh, in relation to your uh, subject property. Then you also want to look at actives. So look at actives. The, this value for actives means nothing because these haven't sold. But these are your competition, so you can see what your competition is selling for. You need to price uh, somewhat around your competition. This one is a, is a short sale, so um, I wasn't quite as worried about that price. But you, you definitely want to, to be uh, competitive. And uh, that's where your competition is. Your competition is really quite close there. Um, now, I also think that the next problem that most investors have is they don't know how to value repairs. So I've got uh, Joel up here who works very closely with me. He's the inspector that I use all the time. And I'm not going to bring him up right this minute, but he's going to cover this part. I'm going to go on and cover my part so that they bring up his PowerPoint. But um, the uh, contractor that I use is sick today, but the next part of this, and um, just you, this is one of the things that my contractor just kind of uses as a, as a rough estimate. Um, roofing, 250 to 350, and we're talking about not the cheapest, and we're talking about um, paint, um, 172, carpet, 21 uh, for the medium, that's for tear out and pad and everything. Now, you may find that you can do this less expensively. I'm just trying to give you a rough idea because this is the biggest problem I find with new investors is you have no clue about repairs. And we're running out of time here, but um, the next thing then is um, remodeling decisions. Most of you have no clue about what carpet goes with what paint. I don't. I have no clue what paint goes with what carpet. I have no clue what, um, you know, what the cabinets should be. But you need to have a contractor who does. Or you need to have someone who does. That is the most important thing. There's nothing worse than going in and putting the wrong carpet in. There's nothing worse than going in and putting in a, a color that, that is just not going to sell. So make sure that you have somebody that you work with who can make those decisions if you can't make those decisions. The uh, contractor I work with, I think, does a very good job. This is one we have under contract this month, and um, that's the before and after of the kitchen. And he just did a fantastic job. These are just great. So I think you can see that there is a big difference. <laughs> so uh, again, 
those uh, days of the, the, uh, the people that I work with, I'm just going to introduce Joel here again. Joel, when he takes uh, people through a house and does an inspection, he spends about four hours doing the inspection. After he's done the inspection, then he has the, uh, the clients come, the buyers come, and go through the house with him. He's going to show them where to turn off the water in case there's a problem. He's going to show them how to use the sprinkler system. And he will go through and talk to them about the different repairs that need to be done and give them a kind of an idea on what it will take to fix them. He's just absolutely fantastic in that area. I really appreciate uh, all of that. And I, so I talked to Joel about this uh, a while ago. I told him that this is the biggest problem that we have is investors have no clue about how to um, come up with an estimate of repairs. So he said that he would be willing to, uh, to do that training with you. He needs a little bit of money for his time to, to take you around and do that training. But he is willing to take you around to any of the houses that you would like to. And he will show you the things that need to be repaired and give you an idea of pricing those repairs. So he's, uh, he's just fantastic. And with, uh, uh, with a great review, I'm just going to change and turn it over to Joel. We'll put his PowerPoint up. And then you can ask him any questions. I'll come back if you have any other questions for me. Thanks, John. This, uh, this number up here has changed. It is 946-1100. Uh, 946-1100 if you need to contact me for any questions. I've, uh, I've been in the construction and remodeling industry for about 20 years. My father-in-law is a contractor. I've worked with him for years. We've done a lot of projects where we've purchased properties. We've gone in and done the remodeling work or the renovation work and then flipped them. We've had great success with many. We fell on our noses with a few, but that's kind of the, you know, the, the road that you take in this business. But uh, one of the crucial things is to be able to understand and to, to be able to project what some of these costs are as you initially look at a, pro at a property, what is it that you're looking at and what are some of those expenses gonna be at, at the end when you're trying to sell it? How much profit are you gonna be able to make? So those are some crucial questions to, uh, to, to ask yourself as you go through this. What should you dream about when considering the purchase of an investment property? Do we dream of sheep? Well, we're looking at really several different components of the home that you want to really carefully consider their condition. One is the structure. Obviously, you want to make sure that the structure of the home is sound. If it's not and you're going to have problems with it, that's one of the costly factors that you're looking at. Um, the years of experience that I've had as, as, a, as a home builder, as a remodeler, I've been a property inspector for 10 years. I've inspected over 2,000 properties. Um, Sometimes you have to know what you're looking for, and other times it's pretty obvious. But the structure is crucial. Also, HVAC system. That's one of the bigger costs, that if there's something substantially wrong with it, it, it costs a good penny to be able to, to repair that or to replace it. So to uh, be able to analyze the uh, condition of the HVAC system. Electrical components. One of the huge things that I find is I go into a property and I find out that the current owner or a previous owner has been the one that's done the do-it-yourself job in the basement. And you go through and you find out that so many things are messed up that you're at a point where you're tearing out drywall to get to electrical wiring to fix it. Now, if you're in the process of doing that, then you have to calculate what cost is it gonna to be to do the tear out, the repair, and then the replacement, and is it worth your money or your time? So that's a big electrical issue that we run into all the time. Environmental issues. How many of you uh, saw on the news last week of this house in Kearns? It was a bank owned property that the people went in and purchased it, found out that there was meth. So now the state has actually closed it and they have to fix it. Uh, they spent five grand just getting into the house and doing repair work and now all that $5,000 is gone. Um, there's huge issues out there with many different environmental hazards that we're dealing with. The big one right now is meth. Um, one, one of the interesting things is, is you can spend you know, anywhere from about 90 to 150 bucks to test for it and, and have the peace of mind that you know exactly what the condition is or you can wait and then have, uh, have your uh, property on the market, uh, have an offer, have an inspector come in and test for it, find out that there's problems and then you have to spend 
two, three, four, five, six, seven grand to get it cleaned up. So it's worth the investment up front to be able to test for something like that. Um, oftentimes you may get questions. Go ahead. Um, that that um, on the news very much disturbed me because, and, and I don't mean to bash anybody, but that was the realtor's fault that that happened to those buyers. And, and that realtor should never have allowed those folks to not have a meth test done on that home. That would have been such an easy, easy thing. The interesting thing is, is I, I did some research on this property. They actually did have a meth test done, but the company that came in did a, a, a swab or a white test of meth. They go in and they, they, they wipe the walls and then they try and get some of this residue and they take it and analyze it. Um, actually, I worked on a deal with Dusty.
Fair word. Again, Utah Building Code changed back in 2001 to. Uh, so you, it used to be three layers. That's based on the square footage of the roof, not the house. Correct. Yep. Square footage of the roof is different from the square footage of the home. What happens if there was a third layer prior to 2001? Um, then it's okay. Yeah. If you can if you can prove that that third layer was installed prior to 2001, you're okay. Yep. Okay. So different ideas with uh, different aspects of the furnace. Um, generally. And this is where it gets kind of tricky sometimes. Generally, the lifespan of a furnace is about 25 years. But you know what? Throw it out the window. It's based on how well people maintain it. I've seen furnaces last 50 years. I've seen furnaces last five years. It depends on how they're maintained. If the filter is not changed, it's the number one reason why furnaces go out and that they need to be replaced. Filters are not changed. As you go in and you pull out a filter and you can, and you can see that it hasn't been changed in years, that's one red flag to look at because it's making the furnace work a lot harder to be able to, to, to circulate that air through the system. So, verify the condition of the furnace. Again, repair costs or replacement costs are based on the type of furnace, the, the size of square footage that it's, it's covering, and uh, but you can kind of expect 25 years if it's well taken care of. Some of the electrical issues that we look for. This image on the right is actually an infrared image that we go through and do a scan on the house to verify if there's any issues. And this infrared actually works great with everything. Structure, plumbing, HVAC, electrical. This is an idea that gives you that this circuit breaker right here is actually overheating because of the fact that they've run probably 16 different outlets. Again, here's another perfect example of someone doing their own work in a basement. They've run 16 different outlets on one circuit. And so as you, as you start to use the electricity through that, through that circuit, it's overheating, it's causing a problem. Now it could blow the circuit, it could, um, if there's some, some wire that's damaged along the, that circuitry, it could cause a spark and a fire. There's many different aspects or scenarios that can come about because of that. So it's crucial to be able to verify the condition of the electrical. Um, those electrical contractors are getting anywhere from 60 to 90 bucks an hour is what they're going to charge to come in and uh, give you an idea. One of the things to really look for is between 71 and 74, the primary source of electrical wiring was aluminum wiring, and it's proven to be fatal. Um, it's not a good conductor of electricity, and it actually causes a lot of problems because of the fact that it can easily spark and overheat. So. This picture you've got there, is that only going to occur when the system's under load then, or is it? It's both. It's both. This actually, this was not under load, but this is showing that the breaker is, is struggling to incorporate that power because there's so many outlets on that one load. So once you load it up, it's even going to get worse. Environmental issues again: meth, cold, radon, lead-based paint, asbestos. Here's some of the different costs that it takes to be able to, to mitigate that. Um, there are different companies out there that can go in and clean a property that has been um, infested with meth, but it's not cheap. Again, it's based on the square footage. But uh, a guy that I know, his name's Mike Rosey. He's the owner of Certified Decontamination. He's the best in the state, in my opinion. Um, everything's based on the square footage, but he guarantees he can clean a house regardless of the situation. Um, Mike Rosie, R O W Z E E, Certified Decontamination is his company. Um, he's done some projects for me in the past, and we found properties with extremely high levels of meth, and he's gone in and cleaned them up down to the point to where they, they meet those state requirements. So. Mold, again, it's, it's areas where you're tearing out and replacing drywall or damaged other uh, material. Radon gas, I don't know if you're familiar with radon, but again, if those levels come back, you're looking at mitigation. How serious is this mold thing? You know, it, it, the things that we're looking at is really, most of these issues, they're hazardous for children. Um, children are still developing their respiratory systems and, and you stick them in an area that the back side of the drywall is mold infested, they're going to get sick, so they're going to have different types of symptoms. If kids have allergies or asthma, it affects them more severely. 
And so it's an issue that if you can find it, there's a lot of myths out there. It's like, oh, we can clean it, we'll spray ammonia on it and scrub it down. You can to a certain extent, but when it gets embedded in the material, you cannot do that. It just takes care of the surface. You've got to replace it. So What's material? Are you talking about drywall? drywall? Talking about carpet? It could be. It could be carpet. It could be drywall. It could be wood flooring. It could be numerous different types of material. If it's embedded within, within the core product, then you just have to tear it out and replace it. So on the mat, per square foot, are you like counting the square foot of the standing wall or the square foot of the room? Basically, the square footage of the home. Um, they base it on the square footage of the home. So, if you have a 2,500 square foot house, you may be looking anywhere from 25 to 3,500 bucks to get that cleaned up. Again, it's it's based on the level as well. Sometimes, if you're just above where that state recommended level is, there's there's easier processes to get it cleaned up. If you're dealing with a house where they've cooked meth, then some of these figures are going to be a lot higher. There's a property that I just did two weeks ago. Levels came back at 20. They were cooking There's a lot of questions. Maybe you can ask it later. We probably need to move on. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll be up here to answer any questions that you have. Plumbing, again, same kind of thing. One of the big things that we find are areas where um, around the shower pan and stuff like that that leak. You can go in and caulk it, but it's not gonna it's not gonna work. Most likely, you have to tear out this whole section and get a whole new shower enclosure. Again, it's a big expense for material and cost if you're into it. So, just to kind of give you an idea, um, I've run this over with Dusty, and I'm happy to come out and help you analyze any property to be able to take a look at it with a different set of eyes and give you an idea of what cost maybe you're looking at. Uh, my fees are here as following, 75 bucks an hour, 50 for the, uh, for the first hour, 50 bucks thereafter. You can keep me all day if you want. You can have me come out and just take a quick look at a property for you. Um, we can also do, we're certified in all of these different types of tests that we've talked about and the different costs to do that. Oftentimes you do want a third party um, analysis done so that it's not something that someone comes up to you and you say, oh, we've tested it for meth and it's okay. Well, if you were a home buyer, would you trust the home seller? If they said we've tested it, it's negative? No, third party analysis takes, takes all that worry away. So. Um, Again, if you have any questions for me after the fact, I'll be more than happy to talk to you about it. So. so again, you're not going to be able to take a contractor to go out to every property that you want to put an offer on. You're going to wear out your contractors real fast. You need to learn how to estimate these repairs. Joel will help you to do that. I just also want to take this, this chance to thank all of you for all of the things that you teach me. I think it's a, a two-way street. Jason helped me put this PowerPoint together. I have no clue how to do PowerPoint. So we're always learning, and I appreciate all that you do. And we also want to thank all of the people that run this club, Matt and Randall and Lisa and all of the, the people that really make this, put this information together for you because it takes a lot of time. Thanks.